Okay, let's uh, start from the very beginning. The training process in equine athletes, paramutual equine athletes, high speed racehorses, is for all intents and purposes a manufacturing process. The manufacturing process in any business means taking raw material, preserving that raw material, and processing it through the manufacturing process to enhance its marketable qualities. And the racehorse, of course, is marketed on the racetrack. So the idea is to manufacture through a conditioning process or a training process, a viable equine athlete that will uh, produce profit on the racetrack. Now, the way things are today, most racehorses do not produce a profit on the racetrack. In fact, most racehorses, maybe 98, 99% of racehorses are non-profitable animals. And the reason is because uh, these performers, these athletic performers, can't perform very often. Uh, first of all, they can't get to the races, most of them. And once they do get to the races, they get hurt very easily. They're fragile athletes. The same kind of fragile athlete that uh, we'd see if our pro football teams uh, did not exercise their athletes all summer long and uh, when the fall came and uh, it was time to go out and perform they all went out in the same at the same level of fitness as our equine athletes uh, they wouldn't last more than two games before their body parts began to come unglued and this happens with uh, our racehorses is that they're not conditioned to the fullest extent possible. In fact, they're not remotely conditioned to the fullest extent possible. And the result is that A, they don't perform up to potential, and B, they don't last very long. They break down. The wheels fly off. Now, exercise science says that uh, you can make huge differences, A, in performance, and B, in durability of the athlete if you take the time to make the animal's body change in response to stimuli, which would be exercise stimuli, because the living body, the living organism, is plastic. The living organism can change with stress. It adapts. You uh, do a piece of work today, three to five days later, uh, all the systems that were challenged by the work are now upgraded to, to an extent. Once they're upgraded, you come back with more work, a progressively loaded work schedule, so that each time the horse, the animal, reaches a new plateau of A, performance ability, and B, durability, the, the ability to withstand some of the uh, high energy demands made uh, on the racetrack. Structural fitness is more difficult to build than is chemical fitness. And what we mean by structural fitness is uh, bones, tendons, ligaments, cartilage pads, uh, muscle fascia, um, to a degree heart and lungs, uh, the vascularization of the heart-lung interface or the uh, vascularization of the, of the muscles. These are all tissue changes that have to take place before uh, huge loads are put on them. And tissue changes take longer to accomplish than do chemical changes like fueling up the muscle cells or uh, storing uh, uh, oxidative enzymes uh, uh, for the blood to become uh, uh, a buffering entity for when lactate uh, appears on the scene and needs to be buffered. Uh, those chemical changes are easier to come about than the structural changes. And so you have to begin with, in your conditioning program, you have to begin with structural conditioning. 
The nice thing about structural conditioning is that uh, you don't have to go fast uh, to build strong bones, tendons, ligaments, uh, cartilage. You can start with slow work. If you do minimal slow work, though, if you uh, spend just, let's say, 60 days doing a mile to two miles slow every day, uh, you won't get much structural change at all. What you'll get is a week's worth of structural change and then you'll repeat that exercise for the next uh, six to eight weeks and uh, get no stronger an athlete. You'll get an athlete that is more coordinated. You'll get an athlete that is whose muscle cells are better fueled, but as far as structural conditioning, you know, the ability to withstand the concussion of 10,000 to 12,000 pounds uh, per stride in a race, uh, uh, stops when the mileage stops, uh, when the growth in the mileage stops. On the other hand, if you spend time and you build that mileage so that every three or four days a uh, half mile of uh, extra galloping is added, added to the daily workload, so that the horse starts out with uh, a mile a day of galloping and then goes to a mile and a half and then goes to two miles then goes to two and a half miles, and keeps building uh, up to, and what we're suggesting here is a, is a six mile uh, daily mileage, all at once daily mileage base. Uh, and this six miles is uh, nowhere near what the animal can actually do. The animal can be built so it can do 50 miles in a day. Uh, Stenero was an animal who did uh, 15 miles a day and she won the Japan Cup after being uh, a horse that uh, uh, came off the racetrack sour, uh, came off the racetrack completely unwilling uh, to go onto a racing surface. Um, Frank Dunn took uh, Stenero and uh, 12 more of his uh, horses away from the trainer, took the horses home and built Stenero and built most of the other ones up to a 15 mile a day working program. Um, took him a year to rebuild this horse. Uh, she was able to do 15 miles a day. One of the reasons she was able to do it was because she was eating about 25 pounds of grain every day. Um, took a long time to build her to that point, but once she was built to that degree, then Frank was able to do five mile intensive work days. Uh, in other words, instead of doing uh, five slow miles, he'd be doing 15 slow miles, and that allowed him to do at least five miles of intensive work twice, sometimes three times a week. And the result of that conditioning program was that when she went to the uh, races, uh, she was very good. Uh, she won the Japan Cup, but she was also a horse that recovered very quickly from illness, uh, from any kind of injury, and from races to the extent that at Ascot she uh, won a grade one stakes at a mile and a quarter on Monday and came back Friday at a mile and a half and set a track record winning a grade one stake at Ascot, which is a track that's been in business for a while. How far you want to go with your individual animal uh, is up to you. More is better. If you can take the time uh, to build a horse to 15 miles a day, you're going to see a lot better athlete in both performance and durability than you're going to see if you build to five miles. Uh, if you build a five miles, you're going to see a lot better athlete in terms of stamina, ability, uh, durability than you will see with a one mile a day athlete. So it's your choice. How much leverage is there in conditioning? Uh, It's phenomenal how much leverage there is in conditioning. When I was uh, a swimmer in uh, uh, college, we were working 2,000 yards a day in the pool, and I thought that was a lot of work. Uh, my body went through the uh, transition between uh, conventional training and interval training in 1962 when I was a swimmer at Ohio Wesleyan. Doc Councilman wrote the book called The Science of Swimming, which revolutionized swimming. And we had lost the previous two Olympics to the Australian swimmers, 
when this book came out, and by, by the time the next Olympics came by, all swimmers in the United States were being trained through the interval process that Doc Councilman learned from the human runners and the human running coaches who had implemented that before uh, the swimmers did. And when I was a swimmer, I swam 100-yard uh, freestyle in about uh, 53 seconds, and I swam a 200-yard freestyle in about a minute and 53 seconds. Three of my brothers uh, were swimmers as well. They were all younger than I, and each of them uh, improved the last brother's best times in the 100 and 200 uh, freestyle to the extent that uh, the last brother uh, was uh, swimming 100-yard freestyles in uh, 49 seconds, and uh, uh, his times were uh, not national level. At, the t at that time, uh, if it, when I was swimming, a 49 would have won in national events, but in his time, when he was doing 16,000 yards a day, uh, everybody else was doing 16,000 yards or more a day, and consequently the racing times for the 100-yard freestyle were down in the 45-second area. Right now they're down in the 43-second area, and they're going to be improving continuously as workloads uh, are gradually upgraded. You know, the basic the way workloads get upgraded is that the coach and the athlete realize. The fellow down the street is working harder and is going, going to be fitter and therefore more competitive than they are, so they upgrade their workloads and they try to shape their workloads to fit the demands of the final event. And the better shaped and the better, uh, the deeper the workouts are that they're doing, the better the athlete's going to be when it comes time for, for the race. They know this. Every athlete in the country knows this. The only athletes that don't know this are thoroughbred and standard bred and quarter horse racehorses. So you can make a big difference. And there's not, uh, well, you think one of the, the, the big arguments against doing miles and working hard with a horse every day, the big argument is, well, it costs too much. It's so expensive, these uh, Riders charge seven miles, seven dollars to go around the track one time. Uh, so if they go around the track ten times, it's going to be seventy dollars. Well, uh, that could be true in some cases, but uh, that kind of rider is not used to doing any work for a living, and uh, uh, there are plenty of other riders out there available who know how to sit on a horse for five, six, seven, ten, twenty, fifty miles at a t at a crack and who have the ability to do that uh, and have the fitness to do that and won't be charging uh, an arm and a leg to get that done. Uh, one type of rider is the three-day event rider who is certainly aware of fitness, certainly aware of interval training already, and has the strength and the stamina to stay on a horse for, for this kind of mileage. So uh, when you say it doesn't fit into the racetrack environment, it doesn't fit into the human racetrack environment. It certainly fits into the equine racetrack environment because the horses do want to go out and do work and they're perfectly willing to go out and do work that is progressively loaded. You can't go from A to C. You have to go from A to B to C with a horse. But if you do that, uh, the horse is perfectly willing to go along with as much work as you can find a way to create for him. And the economics is uh, if it's done right, uh, if you don't say that everything has to be done precisely the way it's being done now at the racetrack, then the economics uh, gets better. Uh, you'll find that you can do a lot more work for less money at a farm track or off-track facility or even at the racetrack with the w right kind of people uh, hired to do that work. Costs of $100 a day are being proposed for uh, New York trainers. Uh, with $100 a day, uh, standard bred trainers would be multimillionaires because standard bred trainers uh, typically train for $35 a day. They typically jog a horse five or six miles a day and then twice a week work uh, a week do three times one mile heats with 45 minute rest periods between each of those horses. And they have all this gear to put on the horse and all the equipment to attach. And the horses have to stay in the equipment between uh, one mile heats. Still, they train at uh, $35 a day. How do they get away with it? Well, uh, 
who knows how they get away with it, but to say that it re would require $100 a day to train a thoroughbred racehorse at a New York track is an absurdity that uh, it's, it's real hard to ignore. Somebody's trying to gouge somebody because it doesn't cost that much for hay. It doesn't cost that much for help. Um, it costs that much to wine and dine uh, rich owners. Uh, costs that much to join the country club and to uh, uh, fly in your own Learjet. But uh, when it comes down to actually training horses, your costs are significantly lower than that. And if you can't do it at the racetrack because costs are prohibitive there, then it's very easy to move off track onto an off track facility and get all your conditioning done first before you go to the racetrack. Of course, most uh, thoroughbred trainers uh, aren't interested in conditioning anyway. They they don't have never conditioned a horse, and they never will condition a horse. And uh, most uh, thoroughbred horses are completely unfit to uh, run any race of their ra ra running uh, because they're just not trained, uh, or they're inappropriately trained. What little training they get is inappropriate. For example, our uh, two-year-old uh, thoroughbred runners who are, uh, as babies, are squeezed down to screaming rates of speed so that they can start out racing four and a half furlong races, then five furlong, then five and a half, then six, then six and a half, then seven. And if they survive all that high-speed pounding, uh, then they're tried at a mile and a quarter come derby time. And uh, because of all the specific training pointed at sprint racing, uh, they are sprinters. They've been, con what, what little conditioning they have has been pointed directly at sprinting, and they're not fit to go and can't be made fit to go a mile and a quarter without a complete refitting process, which, of course, no uh, trainer A knows about and B uh, can't accomplish or wants to accomplish. The, the best bet for uh, the conventional trainer is just to throw the horse at whatever race comes up to see if he lives through it. If he does live through it, throw him at the next race and uh, gradually throw him at longer and longer races. And if your horse survives, he'll win the Kentucky Derby. If he doesn't survive, then he'll be like Copeland. He'll be like Devil's Bag, uh, which were uh, probably very top-notch natural athletes, 100% uh, inappropriately trained to run classic distances. So you get into that kind of a situation where you've got no training, and what little training there is is directed strictly at sprinting, and sprint metabolism is built up, and firepower is built up, but the horse can only really go a half mile distance with the amount of fueling and the amount of uh, oxidative capacity uh, that he's built. Our approach says that uh, first you build structure then you build cardiovascular staying power, and then you build high-speed staying power, and finally, at the very end of the process, when you're completely fit, then you go for that last little bit of alacrity, that last little uh, capacity for high-speed uh, exercise. And you can think of, in terms of your exercise program, as having three parts, although these parts are not real distinct from one another, they're a natural progression. Uh, basically, the progression is the increase, the gradual in increase in speed. But as you go through long, slow distance, then into cardiovascular exercise, and then into race-specific exercise, and then finally into the tapering process before racing, you can see that there are stages at which uh, certain bodily systems of the animal take over. Uh, for example, when you uh, heart rate, when your heart rates uh, uh, start averaging above 165, 170, then you're starting to challenge the oxygen delivery system of the of the animal's body. And when the heart rate then reaches above 200, you're actually uh, overcoming the, uh, the uh, heart's ability to deliver oxygen in time quickly enough to support that high-speed exercise. And so at that point in time, you're still challenging the cardiovascular system and actually overcoming it. And uh, you're challenging then uh, the 
lactate system of uh, exercise, exercise performance, where uh, prodigious amounts of lactate are being uh, produced by the high-speed exercise, and uh, either the lactate uh, builds up to the point where the blood pH drops, the muscle pH drops, and contraction of muscles uh, begins to be interfered with, and then finally, uh, stops altogether, uh, just the same way as if you were lifting a, a weight and pretty soon you've built enough lactate so your muscle gets frozen and you just cannot lift that weight anymore. Uh, that's lactate paralysis, <clears throat> and that's basically because there's so much lactate there that the pH has dropped enough to interfere with the chemical processes that must go on to, to continue to crack, contract that muscle. What you're building then when you exercise in those uh, areas where the heart rate is in, in excess of 200 is A, the ability to tolerate lactate, and B, the ability to oxidize lactate. Uh, and this is one of the things that we've found out in the last, in the recent years. It used to be, we used to think of lactate as being a poison, a, a, a waste product thrown off by high intensity exercise that as it builds up it uh, causes a great deal of damage in terms of uh, higher and higher levels of fatigue and subsequent breakdown in the animal because as the animal, the horse fatigues his biomechanical systems go out of whack, his fetlock sinks to the ground and suddenly it's much harder to break over that uh, toe in the front and uh, tendons and ligaments, sesamoids navicular bones, uh, knee bones, as the knee breaks back, the knee bones become chipped, uh, all sorts of things go wrong with fatigue. And we used to think of lactate as being uh, public enemy number one in, in the racehorse. But we found out recently that lactic acid is the primary fuel for high intensity exercise if it can be burned, if it can be oxidized. Now, your horse has three kinds of muscle cells in its body. It has slow twitch muscle cells, it has fast twitch muscle cells, and it has fast twitch high oxidative muscle cells. Slow twitch muscle cells are used exclusively for easy, slow work. Uh, I'm sitting here talking to you, my jaws are moving with slow twitch muscle cells. Uh, however, if I'm going to throw a baseball at 90 miles an hour, it's going to be all fast twitch muscle cells that are doing that kind of work your horse is going to race on fast twitch muscle cells and is not going to race at all in, with slow twitch muscle cells. Now fast twitch muscle cells uh, burn fuel, glycogen, uh, first by knocking off the top carbon of glycogen and uh, getting immediate energy from that. The, the residual product though is lactic acid and uh, Lactic acid can be burned as well uh, and very quickly if there is oxygen present and if there are mitochondria in those fast twitch muscle cells to process the lactic acid. Now fast twitch high oxidative muscle cells do have the capacity to process lactic acid as fuel and that uh, ability can be enhanced uh, greatly through conditioning because as you do high intensity work, not maximal work, but high intensity work for extended periods, in other words um, multiple mile heats for example will at high high speeds, faster than 220 for a thoroughbred, uh, actually faster than 210 for a thoroughbred, faster than 220 for a standard bred. If you can do multiple long distance heats uh, and make that lactic acid pile up and then stay there <coughs> as the fast twitch muscle cells try to find a way to burn it uh, through the use of oxygen, then the fast twitch muscle cells, just like the bones, tendons, and ligaments, cardiovascular system, will adapt. And they'll adapt by uh, creating more mitochondria material within themselves so that when the lactate becomes present, it can be burned. And the whole key to be, being able to maintain high rates of speed for a distance hinges on the ability of the fast twitch muscle cells to oxidize lactate before it gets out of line, before it goes out the roof and your horse becomes paralyzed at the three-quarter pole. That's the key. 
and that's the key to building horses that can run a mile or longer. Uh, horses running six furlongs uh, uh, can almost get away with six furlongs if they're well fueled. Uh, they can get away with six furlongs without uh, running into very big <coughs> uh, amounts of lactate. Uh, at seven furlongs, seven furlongs is probably the hardest race for a thoroughbred because that's where you start crossing the border into very high lactates that uh, fatigue. You're still in almost a maximal sprint, but you're extending that sprint far enough so that lactate fatigue really begins to play a big part. And a horse that's unable to burn lactate is going to experience uh, high lactate levels and high levels of pain and fatigue and then injury. So seven's a real tough race for a thoroughbred. A mile is a real tough race for a standard bred for the same reasons. Uh, uh, standard breds work harder than thoroughbreds, about 12 times as hard as a thoroughbred, and so they're fitter going into their races. And standard breds have to be honed on uh, at uh, uh, their lower rates of speed just to get competitive with everybody else because standard breds are trained and uh, uh, it's harder than to bring one to competitive fitness because all your competitors are also training their horses very well. So standard breds have to be honed on. Thoroughbreds basically come to speed uh, all by themselves. Uh, they don't come to uh, staying power all by themselves, however. So again, we're thinking about these three stages, and we think of in, the, in the first stage, the, uh, the structural conditioning. Structural conditioning takes place all the way throughout the entire training process, but you have to start with the structural before you do the speed, or otherwise the horse will come to speed in 35 days and his legs will fall off. Uh, speed is easy to come by. Structural change and tissue changes are very, very difficult to come by in any living organism. Uh, it takes months and months and months, probably takes six to nine months to make bone significantly stronger, to make tissue changes, for example, building mitochondria in uh, fast twitch muscle cells, probably takes at least 90 days to really significantly get that uh, process going. So you start with the hardest thing to do. You start with the thing that's going to take the longest time. And luckily, because in slow work, just the flexion of the tendons and ligaments over and over and over again thickens and strengthens uh, those tendons and ligaments. The collagen fibers that are in the tendons and ligaments uh, bond together with uh, in the beginning what they call reducible bonds and later on uh, as they thicken and get stronger the bonds between collagen fibers become irreducible uh, basically a lot tougher and a lot harder to break. Um, cartilage in the joints uh, tends to layer on much like uh, uh, calluses layer on your hand as you start shoveling snow in the winter. By the end of the winter you've got a good set of calluses because you've done a lot of uh, snow sho shoveling. On the other hand, cartilage is, is very much like uh, calluses in that any day that you go out and do an unusually hard piece of work those calluses will rip right off your hands. They won't be uh, there anymore. You'll have raw tissue underneath because your workload surprised them. Surprised them with too much stress to uh, live up to. Uh, at some point in time, uh, you're, you can build calluses hard enough and thick enough to do just about any kind of work but it takes time to build those calluses. And if any day you go out and surprise them with an unusually high level of work, they'll rip off. And so will cartilage in your joints. It'll rip away, slough away uh, with surprises. And that's one of the rules of training a racehorse is uh, no surprises, no big jump in stress of any kind, in mileage, in uh, feed changes, in speed changes. Uh, the biggest uh, thing that goes wrong with interval training uh, is dramatic changes in speed. Um, the conventional trainer who sees uh, a horse that has been doing, let's say, six or seven 
three minute miles a day for the last uh, four months, uh, this horse will look awfully fit to the conventional trainer because the conventional trainer is dealing with uh, fat boys. Uh, his horses uh, are never going to look as fit as uh, a horse that's fit to do six or seven three minute miles at a, at a sitting. Still, that six or seven mile horse is not fit for a single quarter mile in 24 seconds or 23 seconds. Uh, that is the kind of exercise that will crack his bones and rip his tendons and uh, wipe away what uh, collagen uh, has been built, what cartilage has been built uh, through this caref careful four months worth of preparation. No surprises. Bone gets thicker and denser with uh, long, slow distance. That just that repeated concussion over and over and over again is going to gradually make those cannon bones solid steel. And uh, the people who do 50 and 100 mile endurance races can tell you that that it's it's almost impossible to break one of those cannon bones with a sledgehammer. Uh, they've got very tough cannon bones. Um, on the other hand, uh, when you do a surprise piece of work on a, on a cannon bone, what you'll get is uh, a very rapid remodeling of that cannon bone. The, uh, from inside out, the bone uh, sends out little tubules to, to lay down extra bones to thicken that cannon bone so it can stay uh, sound during uh, the time that it's experiencing those 22,000 pounds with a concussion anywhere from a walk at uh, 1,000 pounds of concussion to a uh, scream and gallop at 18,000 to 20,000 pounds per stride of concussion on that uh, left front leg. Uh, all along the way of the conditioning process toward that kind of speed, the bones have to be gradually uh, developing. Uh, one surprise bout of exercise causes that uh, bone to rapidly try to remodel. When it starts to do that, it doesn't do it by taking in calcium and minerals from outside the body. Instead, it robs the bone itself from its own uh, uh, calcium and minerals and builds this uh, uh, lattice work that then eventually fills in with uh, mineral and calcified uh, material. Uh, when it's doing, when it's remodeling, one of the things that happens is the density of the bone drops uh, significantly. Then if you come back with another piece of speed or uh, two or three more pieces of speed, you can almost virtually count on that bone either fracturing or bucking the shins because the lattice work shatters with with a new piece of work. Uh, you've got, once you start a bone to remodeling very rapidly, then you've got a fragile piece of bone. It's the same thing with your uh, big-legged horses. Um, the, uh, the horse with what they call good bone on his uh, lower legs, the thick-boned horse, uh, that bone is porous bone. And we've, we've found that out with our ultrasound bone density uh, studies. We found out that these little fillies with a little toothpick legs, uh, big bodies, huge hips, huge shoulders, but little tiny legs, uh, which everybody uh, uh, complains about when they talk about breeding and breeding racehorses and breeding useless horses. They say that these quarter horses with the little skinny legs and the big round butts, these are horses that are uh, destined to break their legs. Well. Uh, not true. What you find out is the big boned horses uh, have the most porous bones, which are most easily broken or most easily easily injured. And those little fillies with the skinny little leg bones, uh, those cannon bones are made of solid steel. They're tough bones, and they can take a lot more abuse than can the uh, good boned horse. Uh, so you, what you're looking for in a uh, potential racehorse is a lot of muscle mass around the ball joint, the joint of rotation of the hip, a high center of gravity in the leg, and then lower legs that can flick the ground rather than land on the ground and bounce on the ground and can have concussion on the ground. Instead of that, you want a leg that just flicks the ground, and that's light, light bone below. And the light bone invariably is denser than the big, thick, porous uh, bone. 
solved all the way through the process, even though we could take a ball peen hammer and hit our horse in the shins and get a real dramatic remodeling of the bone, what we want is a slow remodeling of the bone. So as the bone uh, grows, it stays strong, but uh, thickens, and especially with horses with uh, slightly crooked legs and this kind of a thing, that it changes to accommodate those extra stresses that the crooked leg puts on the uh, on the bone itself. Uh, you'll, what you'll find is a horse that's off one way or another will gradually configure its body to accommodate those defects. Uh, if you go slow enough, if you go fast, uh, then those conformational defects uh, really make a huge difference and uh, bad-legged horses uh, uh, will not uh, live through a very fast uh, conditioning process. So while that seven mile a day horse looks fit to the conventional trainer, he is not fit. And he feels good, he's uh, completely calm, he's kind of a push button horse because he's had a lot of mileage under saddle, but he's not fit to race, not remotely close to being fit to race. In fact, not as fit as the conventionally trained horse is uh, fit to race. But we've got a lot more work to do with the uh, uh, interval trained horse. The next step as we go into the conditioning program is uh, gradually we build it to our six miles and we sit there at the six miles a day and make sure the horse is liking it, make sure that the uh, shoeing job is done properly, that the horse is balanced right, is moving properly, make sure that our training surface is pristine as it, as it possibly can be. Uh, any problems that we're experiencing so far uh, in the long, slow distance should be resolved, uh, the causes found and eliminated. Uh, for example, uh, one of the things that can go wrong in, uh, in building just plain mileage is a generalized uh, filling of all four legs. And this is a vascular problem. And it's, uh, it's a vascular problem because the blood vessels in the, in the lower legs don't have the resiliency, don't have the, the strength to uh, uh, resist bagging out when, that, when gravity draws the fluid down to the leg. Later on, they get their elasticity and can squeeze those fluids back up into the, into the horse's body. If you find a horse that is filling uh, down low, uh, uh, you haven't got an injury, but you do have a problem that you have to attack, and that means that you have to back up on your exercise. You have to start uh, wrapping for a few days to squeeze that fluid back up into the uh, higher parts of the body, and then uh, sneak back up into the kind of distance that you were doing before those legs filled. You have to go back a little bit and walk back through the mileage building. Too far too soon produces uh, generalized filling in the legs. And all these problems have to be under control before you increase the speed. Now, here's another thing about background mileage that Frank Dunn taught us with uh, his Stenera horse. And that is that uh, you can't uh, do hundreds of miles at a different stride than the horse is going to have to use uh, in a race, uh, because just like treadmilling or just like swimming, uh, it's the wrong kind of muscular exercise. And if you do a lot of it, you're going to e exercise those muscles into the kind of neuromuscular coordination that is inappropriate for racing purposes. The hobby horse canter, for example, the up and down hobby horse canter, lots of miles at that kind of uh, speed uh, are going to produce a horse that likes to go up and down, and you're going to play hell trying to change him to an open, long, loping stride, an easy, efficient stride uh, that he'll have to use eventually in the, uh, on the racetrack. So what we'll typically do in our mileage is uh, perhaps build uh, our uh, mileage up to four miles uh, with slow mileage, and once we get at four miles, we'll stay there for two, three, four weeks uh, and sneak down on the time that that uh, four miles takes us to accomplish. For example, if we're doing four miles at a four minute rate, uh, we eventually want to get down to somewhere near four miles at a three minute rate 
before we go on up to five miles and then six miles and get down to our nice open lope and that may be 320 for some horses it may be 250 for other horses and basically what you want to do is instead of jerking back that horse's head and keeping it at a four minute rate you it, when the horse asks to go a little faster you let it until you get down to uh, an open lope, a four beat stride, that wagon wheel kind of stride as opposed to uh, the up and down hobby horse stride. And then you move on. Um, the line between background mileage and uh, cardiovascular work is, is uh, not very easy to see, but once we get up to six miles a day and the horse is doing it very comfortably, then we'll say that we're moving over into cardiovascular exercise because then what we do is we shift into two hard workouts a week with the rest of the work days uh, being uh, recovery days or uh, easy slow mileage and we'll actually cut back our six miles a day to four miles a day so that uh, on our hard work days the horse has a, a little bit extra energy to go ahead and accomplish the miles that we're trying to get done in there and with both standard breads and thoroughbreds, uh, we do triple mile heats with 10 minute rest periods between. And if we've got a horse that is doing uh, six miles at a three minute rate of speed, the same horse uh, can easily do uh, twice a week, can do three times one mile with 10 minute rest periods uh, with the fastest possibly in uh, 245. So you might do a 310, a 255, a 245 uh, with 10 minute rest period between, a warm up prior and uh, a warm down after. The warm up uh, prior to any kind of energetic work is essential and the reason it's essential is that uh, just like you and I sitting here right now, 90% uh, of the capillaries in our body are shut down. They're not doing a thing. Uh, they're closed and we're not getting blood delivery or oxygen delivery to uh, uh, the musculature or the tendons and ligaments or any, any place in the body that uh, is not really doing any work. It's not getting its blood supply. However, as soon as you start doing some exercise, those capillaries will open up and the blood si supply will flow into muscles, tendons, and ligaments. And those muscles, tendons, and ligaments tend to, when they get warm, they stretch and get flexi flexible and elastic and can take a lot more bending stress and stretching stress than they can if they're unsupplied with blood. For example, a thoroughbred who invariably starts out of the gate with no warm-up whatsoever uh, is starting out with a huge risk of injury to his tendons and ligaments and muscle. Muscle pulls are, are common in horses too because the muscles and tendons and ligaments aren't warm, they're not stretched, they're not ready to stretch and uh, instead they'll they'll tear and, uh, rather than, with a, than stretch and a, a start out of the gate. So we do warm up so that we don't do any soft tissue damage uh, and so that the horse's stride is efficient and flexible uh, right from the very beginning of a workout and we don't risk uh, that kind of injury then. And when we do triple heats, uh, multiple heats in a workout, uh, we'll do those with the first heat being also kind of a warm up heat. It's going to be much faster than the warm up, the slow mileage warm up. And the slow mileage warm up might, can, might consist of two and a half miles at, of 320, 3, 310 speed, somewhere in there. But we want our uh, horses to be as flexible and able to accommodate the, the stressful work that we're about ready to do uh, with ease. And anything we can do to enable that, uh, we do. The warm up is the best possible thing you can do. Um, so then we'll do our triple miles, and as we do our triple miles, what we'll find out is the faster we go, the more the heart rate goes up in response to the exercise. And uh, while the heart rates may have been uh, hitting, uh, peaking out at uh, 160, 165 uh, with our uh, six miles at a three minute rate of speed, now the heart rates will start climbing up into 170s, 180s, and sometimes into the 190s with our uh, triple heat miles. We want that to happen. We want it to happen gradually. And the reason uh, we want it to happen is that the horse's cardiovascular system is real difficult to 
stress effectively. Uh, the reason for that being that the horse has a spleen which typically sequesters away uh, up to 50% of his red blood cells, hides them away so that they're not out there in the uh, bloodstream when he's just walking around the uh, pasture. But as soon as the lion jumps out of the bush, uh, the horse's adrenaline uh, hits the spleen, the spleen contracts, and wham, he's got 50% more uh, or 100% more red blood cells out there carrying oxygen uh, to the muscles. And so he's got uh, the equivalent of a backpack of endurance uh, waiting away, hiding away in his spleen, waiting to be injected into the bloodstream I at a time of emergency. So if he's got that, then challenging that system, challenging that oxygen delivery system is a more difficult task than it is with human beings. Uh, if he can kick in 50% uh, more red blood cells uh, or 100% more red blood cells, then how can we uh, tell his body that uh, it needs more oxygen without really doing some serious extended work at higher rates of speed? Speeds that uh, uh, require that even more oxygen be, be delivered than double the firepower, uh, the uh, spleen injection of the red blood cells is going to deliver. But we don't want to do that all at once. We don't want to start with work that will uh, cause that much uh, stress and strain because we're still building connective tissue. We're still building structural systems. And we want to bring on the speed slice by slice just like you peel an onion. You don't want to surprise any systems. So gradually we, get, uh, we do our triple miles faster and faster until finally the horse is down doing triple miles uh, in a thoroughbred uh, faster than two minutes so that the third mile and the three miles is going to be maybe in the 145 area. Uh, in standard breads, the uh, fastest mile is going to be somewhere in the 210 area. Uh, in doing so, uh, we go all the way through the development and this, this may take three to four and sometimes five months on, on some horses. Uh, but we go all the way through a stress of the cardiovascular system, and this, the cardiovascular system responds by uh, uh, producing, first of all, creating more capillaries in, or, in and around the heart-lung interface and down inside the musculature so that uh, when it experiences uh, a heart rate going from 33 to 242 beats a minute uh, and pumping double-thick blood, that it doesn't blow out the capillaries in the lungs, it doesn't explode those capillaries, it doesn't cause the uh, 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 pressure to uh, damage any, any tissue. Instead, uh, the pressure is dissipated through miles and miles and miles of extra blood vessels. The whole transportation system can be doubled uh, in the horse's bloodstream. Now at the same time, as we pass down through the cardiovascular conditioning process, we are activating more and more fast twitch muscle cells and depending less and less on slow twitch muscle cells. And this is the first time then we start to introduce uh, racing level muscle performance uh, as we pass through the cardiovascular process. When we were doing the background mileage, uh, we were just ac activating slow twitch muscle cells, which will never be used in a, in a race. And as the horse muscled up, and we saw him muscling up uh, in the long, slow distance, all that muscle firepower, all that muscle fueling that we're seeing happen as those muscles start to bulge, all of that is useless for racing. And so what we're going to see as we go through the cardiovascular stage into the specific racing preparation is a change in the muscles. Uh, we do want bulgy muscles. We do want uh, the animal to uh, put on muscular weight. Um, and uh, let's, let's talk about that for a second before we go on. Most of your... Uh, thoroughbred trainers and some of your standard bred trainers uh, like the idea of having a horse built like a greyhound, a skinny, bony, uh, quote, light horse, a racy horse. And they think that uh, coming off the uh, 
farm that these horses with bulging muscles are uh, fat. And that muscle that is there uh, from long, slow distance uh, uh, is useless weight. Okay, it is, it is not the weight that we're going to be using racing. But as we go through conditioning and we start transferring the workload from slow twitch to fast twitch muscle cells, the fueling will uh, go to the fast twitch muscle cells and not the slow twitch muscle cells. So the slow twitch muscle cells will get smaller and the fast twitch muscle cells will get bigger. Still the weight is going to remain the same uh, or hopefully even uh, the weight even comes on. Uh, so when a trainer says he wants to lose 150 pounds of weight off this farm trained uh, horse, uh, he's mistaken. He doesn't want to lose the weight. He wants to shift the weight from slow twitch to fast twitch muscle cells. Uh, science says that the horse, uh, a fat horse, not a race horse, but a show horse, let's say, that's unconditioned, uh, is going to carry around a maximum of 20 to 25 pounds of adipose tissue, uh, fat tissue. Uh, that tissue on a thoroughbred uh, drops to about 11 pounds, a uh, fit thoroughbred. And the horse has to carry some fat tissue. You have to have some fat tissue in the horse. So when a trainer says that he's going to take 150 pounds off this, quote, fat horse, what is he saying? Uh, where is that weight going to come from? It's not going to come from uh, the horse's brain. We know that there's only about 20 pounds maximum in there to be taken off uh, through taking away fat, where is the weight going to come from? Uh, it's going to come from muscles. Uh, the uh, muscles will be drained of their fuel and the horse will go into racing glycogen deficient. And this is the whole, the whole thing on this big fat feeding fat controversy. If you've got a glycogen deficient horse racing, then the fact that you're feeding him 10% fat, uh, that 10% fat will help to spare glycogen as the horse stays alive from day to day, and you'll have more muscle glycogen storage. And that's why they're saying uh, to feed fat. But on the other hand, if you feed adequately and are not trying to uh, get your horse skinny, but instead are trying to build muscle and build him into a... Uh, rough and tough, strong athlete, uh, you won't have to worry about feeding fat because you'll be storing muscle glycogen in those muscle cells. If you're feeding enough carbohydrate, you'll get muscle storage of uh, glycogen without having to worry about feeding fat. And fat, as far as a racehorse is concerned, a paramutual racehorse, fat is a completely useless fuel. It takes three minutes for fat to spin up in high intensity exercise. Uh, lactate is produced and lactate inhibits the use of fat uh, as a fuel. So uh, fat is eliminated as a, as a component of the fueling systems of your paramutual racehorse. Whether he's going a quarter mile or, or two miles, still it's not long enough uh, a distance or a long enough time at exercise to mobilize and use fats as fuel. They're useless. So don't teach your horse's muscles to burn fat because uh, you'll, they'll be storing fat. They'll be storing uh, fat-burning enzymes when really you want them storing glycogen and glycogen-burning enzymes. So as we go through uh, stage two or the cardiovascular stage, we're looking for a gradual shift in musculature. We want those muscles, those forward throwing, those high powered fast twitch muscle cells to start fattening and start being uh, turgid with uh, glycogen and uh, gly glycolytic enzymes. We want they'll actually thicken and sometimes they'll multiply in, uh, in number but more often than not they'll just those muscle cells will uh, thicken uh, and that makes them more powerful. And as we go faster and faster in our works, one of the things that's going to happen is that we're going to recruit more muscle cells at one time. A muscle cell either fires or it doesn't fire. Uh, you turn the switch on and it fires. You turn the switch off and it stops firing. Uh, so it's not a matter if I've only got 10 pounds to lift instead of 25 pounds. It's not a matter of uh, the muscle cell firing less. It's, it's less muscle cells firing. Okay, so... Uh, what we want to try to do in our workouts is recruit 
more and more muscle cells firing at once. Instead of 10 million muscle cells, we want 500 mus muscle cells firing at one time to produce the kind of speed and the kind of power that we need to uh, race with. And the deeper we dig into the muscle cells, in other words, the first heat dig digs in and calls up the first uh, 20 million muscle cells, the second heat, by the time you get to the second heat, uh, maybe half of those 20 million muscle cells are out of gas. And so the workload gets passed on to another 20 million muscle cells waiting in the wings, the backup troops. And so you do the second heat. And once again, you deplete the fuel in 20 million muscle cells, and the call goes out for 20 million more muscle cells to come online and start burning fuel to accommodate the third heat of, of exercise. And so the more heats of exercise you uh, do, the deeper into the musculature, the deeper into the back backup troops uh, uh, you go. And that's what we want to try to do is develop every muscle cell that we can find that's a fast twitch muscle cell. We want it to be armed with fuel and ready for the test uh, when the test and when the workload gets passed to it late in the race. So as we go faster and faster, we're recruiting more and more muscle cells at one time. So by the end of the cardiovascular system, we've come to the point where we are digging deep into the muscles. We have surpassed the ability of the horse's cardiovascular system to deliver enough oxygen in time to uh, keep up with the exercise. Uh, and we're starting to uh, skim into the area where we're trying to uh, teach the muscle cells to accommodate high levels of lactate to buffer themselves uh, from the acid effect of the uh, uh, lactate presence, but also to reattune themselves to take up more oxygen as the blood cells pass by the muscle cells to reach out and grab more oxygen, bring it in to mitochondria and actually burn that lactate um, that is accumulating. And this occurs with exercises that uh, actually sustain heart rates at uh, 200 uh, and above uh, for a, t a period of time. For example, a mile uh, at a two-minute lick with a thoroughbred or a, or a 215 lick with a standard bread is going to cause that kind of circumstance and hold it there for at least two minutes or a little, a little bit longer. Uh, when that occurs, then the muscle cells, the fast twitch muscle cells, adapt by learning to burn lactate through the use of mitochondria and oxygen. And so, again, slice by slice, we move on into the stage three, which is specific racing preparation. Meanwhile, we're still continuing cardiovascular development. We're still continuing structural development. Uh, neuromuscular coordination is still continuing. Uh, neuromuscular coordination. What is neuromuscular coordination? Um, neuromuscular coordination comes about by the efficiency of commands to muscle cells. In other words, uh, how fast does a command get transmitted to a muscle cell and then how quickly can that muscle cell react to that message without any ear interfering uh, uh, factors going on. Um, an interfering factor would be antagonist muscles. Uh, for every, for every uh, muscular action that you have, uh, there are going to be a group of muscles, uh, generally of, of nearly equal strength, that are resisting that activity. In other words, when a a baseball player throws a baseball at 90 miles an hour, the reason he can do it at 90 miles an hour is because the antagonist muscles, the muscles that are designed to hold his arm in the socket, uh, have relaxed enough to allow that velocity of a throw. The antagonist muscles, uh, for example, in a, uh, an aqua tread machine are exercised more than the agonist muscles. Think about it. The treadmill uh, moves uh, the horse's legs rearward. Uh, there is resistance. The, the benefit, supposedly, of an aqua tread uh, or an aquatic treadmill 
is that there is resistance to the motion of the horse, and there is, but it's resistance not to the agonist muscles, not to the muscles that will propel the horse forward, but to the antagonist, the muscles that will prevent the horse from moving his body forward. Uh, the legs of the horse are propelled backwards by the treadmill, and then the resistance is felt by the horse as he recovers his legs through the water, moving them forward to place back on the treadmill. Uh, those antagonist muscles then, if you spend 60 days in an aqua tread, then those antagonist muscles get very well developed and the agonist muscles, those muscles that are going to propel the horse forward on the racetrack, are underdeveloped and you get an imbalance between agonists and uh, uh, antagonists and you find out that then the horse goes back out to run on the racetrack and he gets muscle sore because he's got stronger antagonists than he does agonists. What you're trying to do with your neuromuscular control is uh, make those antagonists, those muscles working against the high uh, output of your forward motion muscles, you want them to relax, you want them to accommodate and uh, uh, not be afraid of that high power output of uh, the forward propulsion muscles. and. Uh, Gradually, your your uh, tendon sensors. There are uh, uh, little uh, nerve cells buried in tendons and ligaments that uh, sense when they're being stretched and turn on the ag uh, the antagonist to try to shut down uh, high intensity uh, motion. Uh, so that the tendons and ligaments don't get torn. Well, as uh, gradually as the body gets used to uh, this high-intensity exercise, those antagonist muscles relax more and more until finally uh, they don't impede the horse's uh, firepower. The horse is allowed, or any athlete's muscles are allowed, uh, to fire at maximum uh, and not be impeded, and that's what comes. That's what delivers alacrity and s snappy speed uh, from uh, fast twitch muscle cells. So the whole idea then is to uh, uh, get established neuromuscular coordination right along with all the other areas of fitness. Another factor in neuromuscular coordination is the fact that. Uh, when, when a muscle is fired in a certain way today, uh, what happens next is, and, and during the recovery days, is chemicals called neurotransmitters are produced and located at that firing node uh, so that the next time that muscle has to fire, it can fire more quickly, it can fire more easily. There's not as much resistance to the command going through the command ch channels uh, into the muscle. And it takes about three days for these neurotransmitters to uh, gather and spin up, and then they'll stay there for about five days, and then they'll gradually uh, fall away, so uh, they won't fall all the way away. There will always be some muscle memory left, some motor memory left in the muscle cell, just like when you learn to ride a bike, you always know how to ride a bike, even though if you skip it for about five or six years, the first few minutes of the... Uh, uh, exercise is a little shaky, but then pretty soon your muscles say, oh yeah, we remember that. Uh, and the reason they remember that action is because there are still some neurotransmitters hanging around the area waiting for that specific command that said, here's how we're coordinated to ride a bike. Babies, baby horses start out with really stupid legs. They don't know how to place them to make speed. Uh, efficient speed, uh, but very quickly, very shortly, neurotransmitters spin up and the, uh, the motion with practice gets better and better and more efficient and more efficient as all of the muscle cells that must fire, the 500 million muscle cells that must fire to produce the galloping motion, all become coordinated and uh, a kind of a little memory map in the in the brain or in the spinal cord of the animal when the when the rider says run that pushes a button that uh, immediately makes the animal uh, run without having to think about where he places his legs or where he's supposed to place his legs so we get a relaxation of the antagonist and we get uh, better quicker communication to the individual muscle cells that must uh, coordinate precisely in nanoseconds of time. Uh, 
with practice, and you have to practice at speed. Uh, uh, that's the specificity of exercise. The law of specificity says that you want a fast athlete, you have to practice fast. If you want uh, a long-going athlete going slow, then you have to practice long-going slow because you want, again, you're developing slow twitch muscle cells instead of fast. If you want a swimmer, then you want certain muscle cells and certain muscle groups coordinating in a certain way, so you swim. If you want a runner, different muscle cells coordinating in a different way make a horse run. If you want a hobby horse up and down galloper, uh, then you hobby horse and up and down gallop him because the open lope, the nice smooth racing lope, uh, is not appropriate for up and down hobby horse galloping. Uh, and vice versa. If you want uh, a nice long open lope, you don't want to be practicing with trot or with uh, cantering up and down the uh, uh, hobby horse galloping because that's inappropriate muscular motion. And worst of all, of course, is the uh, aquatic treadmill with its overdevelopment of antagonic, antagonistic muscle groups. Uh, that's totally inappropriate as far as an exercise protocol. Um, all of these things have to be considered, especially as you're approaching racing, because the last three months of your exercise protocol has to be almost directly focused on the racing activity, the racing event. And that, that racing event is going to have some very specific muscle needs and uh, you have to specifically condition your muscles to deliver those needs. As we pass through then stage three, one of the things that happens is uh, we start thinking uh, about how far this horse is, uh, is going to run. Uh, we don't want to condition a horse to go a quarter mile if uh, we're eventually going to want him to run a mile and a half. And uh, the law still holds up that uh, you condition distance first and speed second. And the reason you condition uh, distance first is because if you get too soon to speed, well, there's an emotional thing that happens with a horse that uh, uh, it's almost that they shift gears. They get into third gear and they don't want to go back to second gear. It's a, if you're traveling at 60 miles an hour and you shift back into second gear, uh, your motor goes awry. And with horses, it's the same thing. You take this filly and uh, get her down so she can do two-minute licks with her eyes closed, and then you back up to four-minute stuff, and uh, it's a continuous battle on the racetrack. She's got her head up, jerking a bit around, wants to go faster, and not behaving herself. She's liable to hurt herself just because she's not in gear to do four-minute stuff when you have already broken the speed limit and gone down into the two-minute stuff. Uh, you can't go back emotionally with a horse and you also can't go back physiologically with a horse for staying power. What you have to do with uh, all your horses and the standard bread doesn't have this problem because they all go a mile but with thoroughbreds what you have to keep in mind is that you're targeting specifically for a racing distance and you want to target long first and build the stare first. Uh, that's the process. Long and slow to short and fast. And uh, really, for our, our two-year-olds, uh, there's no reason to ever show a horse, a two-year-old horse, a 22-second quarter in any workout because uh, really uh, he doesn't, uh, that, that kind of speed is what breaks his legs apart. And uh, you can wait till the end of the year when the miles start coming around. And then uh, in the miles, your two-year-old seldom has to see anything faster than a 23 and most often can sit and hit steady 24s and win an awful lot of races with just straight 24s, bang, 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 bang. You've got yourself a 136 mile, and that's pretty competitive for a two-year-old. Why? Uh, prep him to go four and a half furlongs. It's a, it's a useless distance, cheap speed. Uh, he'll never make any money going four and a half furlongs, and if you target him specifically at four and a half furlongs, you're going to play hell getting him to go a mile and a quarter. Uh, you can't go back for staying power unless you want to start all over again. Staying power is tissue change, where speed is a chemistry change, a fueling change. Uh, speed is easy to come by, staying power is very difficult to come by.
and you have to spend months at staying at building staying power. So, so far we've built long, slow distance. Then we've built cardiovascular speed. Uh, we've got we're building been building staying power for six months now. We might as well continue to build staying power, but staying power instead of for two miles or for uh, longer than that, we'll build staying power for shorter and shorter distances until we're targeted in at our classic racing distances, the mile, the mile and a quarter, the mile and a half. We've got our horse trained to sustain high level effort for those distances or for that period of time, a minute and a half to two minutes and a half. So uh, to, uh, to build stamina at those distances, one of the things we have to consider is that we're going to have to go uh, fast and if we take, for example, with a standard bread, if we take a, a, a standard bread that can go in 205 and we want them to go in two minutes, uh, we, can, we can batter him against that 204 barrier and then batter him against the 203 barrier and then batter him against the 202 barrier until finally we've got him down to two minutes. Uh, but every time you go after a barrier in that way with the full distance at the full speed uh, you're risking the fact that he's not fit to go a 204. If he's a 205 horse he's not fit to go 204 and if you go after a 204 in a race uh, where he gets sucked along or uh, just in a training session where you just go hard after that 204 you're liable to break him down. Uh, how do you get around uh, breaking a horse down that you have to make go faster at let's say a mile. Well you go shorter than a mile. You do heats that are three quarters uh, or shorter, five eighths or, or whatever. Those heats allow you to go faster because you're for sure you can't, uh, the horse that goes 205 can probably easily with his eyes closed go three quarters of a mile at a 204 rate of speed. So you can go faster if you go shorter. But then you're training the horse to go three quarters instead of a mile. If you go half miles, you're training the horse to go half miles instead of uh, miles. That's the law of specificity. Go short and fast, you're going to have a short and fast horse. Uh, so you'll get your speed, you'll get your extra speed, but you'll lose your staying power or stamina to deliver that mile to a mile and a half uh, racehorse. How do you get around that? This is the place where interval training comes in. The rest periods between each heat in uh, uh, a multiple half workout or a multiple three quarter workout are partial recovery rest periods. They're not full recovery. Uh, uh, lactate levels, for example, take about a half hour to uh, come back to half of what they are. If they, if they build to 20 millimoles per liter, they'll drop to 10 millimoles per liter in about a half hour. That's still not back to normal, which is three or four millimoles per liter. So you've got, you, you do a heat and you've got a higher lactate level. It'll, it'll dribble back to a little bit below uh, where it was when you finished that heat, but not much in, let's say, seven minutes time. So you shoot a heat of uh, three quarters, you rest seven minutes, and you've got a slightly lower lactate level than you had at the finish of that heat, but you haven't gone back to normal. And then you hit the second heat and you build even higher lactate level. You build on the lactate level that you built with the first heat, and when you do a third heat, again, you build even higher, and your fourth heat builds even higher until pretty soon in a four heat workout for three quarters, you've got the lactate levels that you would have had, or even higher lactate levels than you would have had in a, uh, a one heat full distance workout, but you've accomplished the speed uh, because you've gone shorter and you've given these rest periods, you've accomplished more speed than you could have is if you stack the same three mile workout together in mile heats. Uh, you've accomplished more speed and you've tied together uh, with these partial recovery rest periods, you've tied together the whole workout enough that you get the stamina effect as well as the speed effect and that's the key to interval training. That's how you get speed and staying power in the same workout without risking 
high levels of fatigue and injury in the animal. And because you're doing a workout that's slice by slice, heat by heat, you can look at the animal as it goes through the process and you can determine how close you're getting to the ragged edge of fatigue. And you can stop a workout short of the full uh, prescription, the, the full prescribed workout, anytime you want to. Uh, for example, when we're taking heart rates on uh, horses, we'll take a, a one minute recovery heart rate. And that, what that means is that the horse uh, uh, shoots a heat. Uh, as he crosses the finish line, you start your stopwatch and the horse slows down to a canter and then to a walk and then comes up next to you and comes to a stop and at precisely one minute you catch that heart rate. And that recovery heart rate then tells you how deeply you dug into the animal. For example, if you uh, see a recovery heart rate at one minute after crossing the finish line that is below 105, um, you really didn't get into the horse enough to cause a cardiovascular effect or uh, a lactate tolerance effect or anything. You didn't dig, dig deep enough. The work wasn't hard enough to, uh, uh, to get a conditioning effect. So uh, 105 and below means you better, uh, next time you do a workout, you better start out a little faster than you just did. Uh, between 105 and 125, uh, in varying degrees, you're digging deeper and deeper into the horse. If you got a 118, you dug deeper than you uh, did at a, at a 110. And as you dig deeper and deeper, you're getting higher and higher levels of lactate, and you're coming closer and closer to uh, the fatigue threshold, which uh, begins to occur somewhere around a 125 recovery heart rate and above. Okay, but Normally, between 125 and 135, you've still got, you're, you're under your caution sign, but you've still got room to do probably another heat. But at that time, you say to your rider, listen, uh, we're getting close to the end of this horse, uh, getting close to the end of this workout. No matter how far into the workout you are, if you've got 125 or above, you're starting to get close to the end of the workout, and you tell your rider, if this horse gives up, spits out the bit, comes back to you anywhere in this heat, shut it down right then. If it's a three-quarter workout and one quarter of a mile into it, the horse spits out the bit, stop the heat right then. Okay. Or if you see a 135 recovery heart rate or above, the workout's over. It's just plain over. Uh, you've done enough. You've dug uh, maybe a little too deep, but uh, 135 is uh, still safe. Uh, in terms of what you just did. You just can't do any more. So if you see a heart rate of 135 and above, uh, the workout's completely over. Uh, and if you did only three three-quarters and you were supposed to do four, fine. Next time, start a little bit slower and get all four of them in and then, and then work on down with your full uh, volume of exercise. This time, though, no matter what the prescription says, no matter what you want to try to get done, you can't drive that horse into this uh, final heat or you'll cripple it. And the, the law of if the horse spits it out, it goes all the way. You always believe your horse. Always trust your rider more than you trust your uh, heart rate and trust your heart rate more than you trust your own eye sitting on the side of the track looking at the horse. Uh, but the rider is the one who finally feels exactly what is going on inside the horse. That's the advantage in, in the standard bread trainer of uh, being able to drive a horse with your hands on his mouth. You can feel, the trainer can feel, when the horse is coming back and given, giving up. And basically, you want your horse, all the way through the entire process, you want the horse begging for more work. Uh, once you go into interval training, which is clear at the beginning of the cardiovascular stage, once you start going into that and you're three or four work into, workouts into it, then suddenly your animal is going to come alive, going to start getting real enthusiastic about working, and the rider's job or the driver's job is there on, there on out to keep the horse from going too fast, not to, not to encourage the horse to go faster, but to keep the horse held back to a point where he's always begging for more work as opposed to hitting him on the back or putting him with company or sucking him along one way or another into a speed that he really can't accommodate at this point. Okay, let's talk about different kinds of workouts. 
Uh, we've talked about interval training being a, a thousand tool toolbox where you can uh, gather together uh, different distances of heats, uh, different rest periods, uh, uh, different numbers of heats, and just, just about build any kind of a, uh, an exercise plan you want for the individual horse. Remembering that when you go short and when you open up your rest periods, uh, you're working on sprint or speed. When you go long and when you're using shorter rest periods, either or, uh, you're looking for staying power. Now with uh, thoroughbreds, when you're working a half mile or less, uh, you're working strictly on sprint, no matter how many uh, heats you do. When I first started out with thoroughbreds, uh, they told me that uh, Thoroughbreds can't take these multiple heats of long distance, and uh, so I, instead of doing that, I started shooting uh, multiple halves and multiple three-eighths. Biggest, biggest mistake in the world. I could shoot six three-eighths with a horse uh, with five-minute rest periods between. Uh, go to the races uh, and race against horses that uh, were breezing a single three-eighths or a single half once every uh, five to seven days and lose because those same horses uh, on their uh, off days were galloping a mile and at the end of that mile or about the halfway through the mile they'd kick in and uh, by the time they hit that final quarter they were hitting that quarter in 24, 23, whatever. But they were fitter than my horses who were so specifically sprint trained that uh, they would hit uh, 3 eighths and 34 hit the half and 45 and then spit it out and wouldn't be able to even uh, carry it to uh, to three quarters. They were really built for high speed and not for a distance. And what you have to remember with a thoroughbred is that uh, really the money is in the longer distances, mile and longer. Uh, a 133 miler is worth uh, 30 million dollars if you look at their recent history. Uh, a 1086 furlong horse is not worth that much, uh, anywhere near that much, because there are a lot of, well, a relatively lot of uh, 1086 uh, furlong horses. Cheap speed is uh, not what you're looking for unless you're uh, racing a two-year-old, and even then you're not, uh, you really don't want to race those two-year-olds at high speed short races because you crack their knees and crack their shins and bow the tendons. So those things, uh, short distances, basically want to be avoided. If you want to build long distance horses, then you're going to have to shoot heats that are longer than uh, a half mile. Uh, in fact, I would never, uh, in a thoroughbred, I would never suggest uh, half miles as a, as a training regimen. Maybe you're tapering back to race, maybe getting to race, you might need a half mile. If you've got a horse that lacks speed, if you have to go for speed with a horse that uh, doesn't have speed, then half miles are useful. In a situation where you've got a horse that can hit uh, 110 or 109 for six furlongs, there's never, ever a reason to shoot three-eighths or half miles or sometimes even five-eighths. Uh, your best bet on those horses is to try to keep them long and slow as much as you can. Uh, now long and slow means uh, multiple three-quarter works, uh, fastest and maybe 114, uh, three or four of those with seven minute rest periods between. That's the interval training process. But there are all sorts of ways to exercise horses and uh, when we say interval training, uh, all we're talking about is multiple heats that have very specific uh, rest intervals between them. Uh, down in uh, Australia, Colin Hayes is their best, uh, one of their best trainers, if not the best trainer, wins the Melbourne Cup quite often. He has um, a three-quarter mile uphill grass gallop, and it's a pretty steep hill. He shoots that uh, three times with his horses. He uh, runs them up it, uh, walks them down it, runs them up. He doesn't actually count the time between the, the heats, but it is about seven minutes, eight minutes. And uh, when he gets down to a certain time on that third of three heats, uh, he knows that he's got a horse that can race a mile to a mile and a half in uh, very competitive time. In England, uh, uh, Michael Stout, uh, uh, 
some of the other uh, trainers over there. Uh, I remember Zill Bear used to do this, multiple heats in rolling country. Uh, in England, they don't uh, use stopwatches. They don't know how fast they're going, but uh, they run horses against gauge horses like our quarter horse trainers do, and when the horse is beating the gauge horse and not breathing hard, they figure they've got a racehorse. Very, very unscientific, but a lot more work than our thoroughbreds get in this country. In uh, uh, Argentina, they use ladder workouts, and ladder workouts were used with uh, Stenera. Ladder workouts are where you start out with a longer, slower distance and tighten down with shorter, faster uh, uh, heats all in one sitting. For example, a mile, and you might go the mile in 145 or faster. Uh, then uh, seven eighths, then three quarters, then a half mile or five eighths, whatever, however you want to mix them. Shorter and shorter and shorter. Each time Stenera ran her, she would uh, gallop out the extra eighth and make sure that uh, she was still willing to go on. So when she ran a mile, she actually went a mile and an eighth. Then she went three quarters and she actually did seven eighths. Uh, then she went five eighths and she actually did three quarters. Uh, but it was a gallop out so that Frank Dunn knew that she was still willing, still on the iron, still wanting to go, and then he would do the shorter, faster heats. Now the reverse ladder, uh, and that's what they do in Argentina, is the, is the shorter and faster ladder workouts. The reverse ladder is quarter, three-eighths, half, five-eighths, three-quarters. Uh, that's far more dangerous because uh, the horse gets comes to speed early in the uh, uh, workout uh, comes to speed first. You should always come to speed last. Uh, speed is the last thing you're after. Uh, endurance and stability is the, uh, is the target that you're looking for. So workouts that start with speed and then try to stretch that speed are very dangerous. You're pushing the horse into uh, high levels of fatigue and into an unknown area where you really don't know uh, whether the horse is going to survive it or not. Uh, recently, uh, another type of workout that was used and has been used uh, successfully in several areas uh, is double headers, where uh, you take you find the target distance, and if it's a mile uh, or longer, then you shoot double miles, where you go out and uh, rather than giving a full 10-minute rest period between those, and again, the 10-minute rest period is my idea of how long a rest period you need if you're shooting three times one mile to glue all three of those miles together for uh, racing ability at a mile and a quarter to a mile and a half. But double headers are just two back to back and basically you go out and shoot a mile easy, uh, 152, 154, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, walk the horse or trot the horse, whatever, until the horse gets uh, the breathing rate uh, comes down and the uh, heart rate, if you're monitoring it, comes, uh, comes down to a comfortable level. That may be six minutes, that may be eight minutes. Uh, then turn and roll another one. This one will be uh, five to ten seconds faster, 142, 143, something in that area. Now the thing about that kind of a workout, a double header, is it doesn't take as much gasoline out of the horse as does a triple header, three times one mile. You're not sucking as much uh, fuel, and that means that the horse will recover in terms of muscle fuel, it'll recover in 48 hours, where three times one mile you might need an extra day just to completely refuel those uh, uh, the glycogen and the enzymes that are in those fast twitch muscle cells. But uh, one of the problems with that kind of a workout, especially if you're doing it every other day or every third day uh, too close together, um, is that every time you exercise the horse, the one of the things you can expect to happen is the bone to feel the stress and want to remodel. And uh, I'll give you an example. We had a quarter horse uh, that was trained conventionally out in Oklahoma that we went took to a racetrack and did a bone density uh, uh, study on him just before he went out to race and immediately after he came back from racing and uh, his bone density dropped about 7%. Now that's not, that's not that big a deal. Uh, they figure that 20% uh, loss of bone density is when you start to risk uh, fracture of the bone. 
But it took this horse three and a half days to uh, recover half of that density. In other words, three and a half percent came back in about three and a half days. Uh, it took him ten days to fully recover the entire bone density loss that he had in that race. Now, that doesn't mean that all horses are going to require that. The one thing you want to realize in that case was that it's an unfit quarter horse out there trying to be raced into shape. Uh, so his bones weren't anywhere near as durable and as tough and strong as they should have been. So that 7% that he lost probably in a, in a fit horse that was, that was truly conditioned to handle that kind of speed, you might see a 2 or 3% drop in, in bone density. And you would probably see a quicker recovery uh, in that. But nevertheless, if you shoot doubles or singles once every two days or once every three days, if you decide that you want to go after uh, uh, an intense training program, even if you're shooting singles, and one of the, one of the things that will happen when you do that is you will get a huge improvement uh, very quickly in speed and some, some in stamina. But you've got to watch out for that thing, that kind of a thing, because you can't do that for very long without the parts starting to show fatigue, the kind of fatigue you get in metal fatigue, the wings of airplanes. Uh, uh, so many stresses without a chance to recover uh, will cause the bones eventually to break. In other words, if you lose two, you gain back two or you gain back one and a half, you've lost a half, and you hit again, you lose two, you gain back one and a half, you lost another half. How many workouts does it take to get to 20% bone density loss? Uh, 20, 25, uh, whatever it is. If you do that too often, then you're going to suffer the consequences of um, a fracture. So you've got to be careful with light workouts. The, the, the idea in good conditioning is that you go out first and build volume so you can do a fat workout. So you can do, if you do six miles of slow, you can do three miles of fast on a work day if you give the rest period between or whatever. Or you can just do the three miles uh, at a moderate uh, rate of speed. You can't blast it all out. but. Uh, you certainly can do three miles worth of speed work if you build to, in the beginning, if you build to six miles worth of slow work. Uh, we just we just know that the horse can stand that kind of thing. And we know that horses can stand racing today and racing tomorrow. There are people who have done that and have, sh and have actually, there was one fellow uh, up in uh, Yakima, Washington, who uh, won five races on a Saturday. Uh, three of the horses that he won with on Saturday had raced on Friday uh, and not and not won. So uh, how far can you go? Uh, I remember Harold Baldowski was, uh, had his horses on a six-day schedule and was very successful with it, uh, racing at Thistle Downs in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, six-day schedule. He'd race today. Uh, tomorrow he would do about two miles with at the end of it at the the last eighth of a mile, at two miles, he'd accelerate and kick in and sprint that. The next day after that, he'd do exactly the same thing. The next day after that, he'd do exactly the same thing. Then he'd come up and do a double or triple half-mile workout, interval workout, midweek. Then he'd, and those halves would be, the third one would be in racing time, okay, and they'd be separated by five minutes, which is a, basically a half interval workout. That's what Barry Wexler uses. That's what Bill Deaton uses on hills. Uh, uh, that's what Dent Caton has used. Uh, half intervals, three times a half, two times three quarters, uh, two times a mile. Uh, and that's all well and good. It depends on uh, what kind of courage you have in turn and what kind of a base you build. Again, uh, Barry and uh, Dent uh, don't like the mileage. They like to stop at three miles. They can't see any changes between three miles and six miles. And the changes that, you, that, are, that do occur are uh, very subtle, and they're happening in the bones and tendons where you can't see them. You're not going to see muscles pump up. You're going to see the rider get bored. You're going to see the horse get bored. Uh, Harold Baldowski uh, would then race on Saturday, and he was having very good luck with midweek half intervals, and then every day a burst of speed. Okay, now. Uh, when you hear that, uh, you think that, well, gee, uh, that's what I should do. It's, that's, that's not very, very difficult. But then 
uh, one of the things we know for sure is that speed, 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 speed produces bone trouble, uh, produces knee chips, uh, fractures in the cannon bones, things like that. You, my best judgment is that twice a week, on a continual basis, twice a week, and then sometimes uh, giving the horse a break and opening up that uh, space between speed workouts to five days instead of three or four days uh, is the best, safest uh, policy of all. Uh, five days between a single heat workout, as is conventionally done with thoroughbreds, uh, is too long. Uh, what, what you're looking for is that point of super compensation. And for a 3 8 breeze or a half mile breeze or a 5 8 breeze, it's very likely that that happens in 48 hours. The bone's not back up there, but the uh, fueling systems are. And if you give the bone an extra day or two days, then you can come back with uh, a breeze or a race. And then there's the concept of resistance exercise that uh, is embodied in the uphill gallops, but is also embodied in those tricks that those Scandinavian trainers were playing on the standard bread guys. Draw, uh, drawing tractor tires behind their horses, uh, drawing jog bikes with brakes on them. Now, uh, this is uh, certainly a weird uh, practice uh, to watch, uh, especially if you're a, a tracker at uh, Santa Anita. Uh, you're not going to see anybody pulling a jog bike or galloping a horse in front of a cart or this type of thing. But again, if you can avoid the crushing pressure on those front legs, especially with babies, uh, if you can avoid the crushing pressure on those front legs and still develop firepower, fast twitch muscle firepower, then you're way ahead of the game. And a way to do this, a very simple way to do this, is instead of putting a saddle on the galloper's back, hook him to a cart where well, he's got enough room to full gallop without kicking the cart, and without getting away. Hook him to a cart with brakes, automobile brakes, uh, and gallop him at high rates of speed or relatively high rates of speed with uh, the brake on. You can put a heart rate on, mo monitor on the horse, look at the heart rate monitor, boost that heart rate to 200 from 160 just with the brake. And when you start crossing 200 into 205, 210, you know that you're firing fast twitch muscle cells. You know that you're developing firepower. And uh, the more of that you do, and the longer distance you can go, and the shorter rest periods you use between those, uh, the more high-speed stamina you're developing. Now, you think of a baby. Uh, babies' uh, muscle cells and, and bone and tendons and ligaments are, are most plastic, most conditionable. Uh, up to about 18 months of, of age. And uh, you want to build strong bones, tendons, and ligaments, uh, and you want those fast twitch muscle cells to be firing during that time so that they don't change into slow twitch muscle cells. If you put a baby in a stall, leave him in a stall, don't let him out to run, uh, then only his slow twitch muscle cells will be activated in that stall. And he will convert, he can, can convert up to 70% of his muscle cells into fast, uh, slow twitch muscle cells by standing still and doing nothing. On the other hand, if you get out and start really rolling him uh, with some resistance exercise, for example, up hills or with a cart with a brake, uh, what you're going to do is activate quite often those fast twitch muscle cells. And that's going to move some of the slow twitch, a good portion of the slow twitch, into the fast twitch configuration. Uh, you're training neurons. You're not training muscle cells in that case. You're training neurons. You're teaching them to fire fast, fire hard, gather more of them together at one time to fire. Later on, when the uh, uh, baby's 24 months uh, old, uh, just turned an, uh, an actual two years old, uh, he's not as plastic. His muscle cells uh, can only change about 7% one way or the other. Uh, his bone is uh, finally knitting, and there's not as much act not as much remodeling activity going on. Uh, still, if you've uh, spent some time, some considerable time, uh, in forcing the horse to do some uh, 
high resistance exercise and while avoiding speed and while avoiding having weight on his back crushing down on those, on those front legs and doing damage to the epiphyseal plates as well as uh, causing uh, a radical remodeling uh, then you're going to have a horse that's really ready to go into some serious exercise and has all his muscle cells together has his whole body developed for speed and power before he ever sees a saddle, before ever a saddle ever goes on his back. And that's what we're looking for. Our babies, uh, you know, no one has explored this. Uh, when you're looking at these various conditioning methods, uh, just realize that everybody out there is doing the same thing as the guy next door. And basically they're doing nothing. Basically they're doing no exercise whatsoever. A minute a day, five minutes a day, a mile once around the track, a little bit of goose on the end, uh, uh, surprise workouts. That's uh, the key to the whole uh, philosophy of, of conditioning is no surprises. Never surprise a horse's body with a sudden increase in speed or a sudden increase in distance or a sudden change in surface or a sudden change in shoeing. Uh, no surprises. Always a gradual introduction to every change that you're making. And you've got to be fully aware of the changes you're making. You can change uh, flat shoes to toe grabs and go out and breeze the same speed and the same distance you did yesterday, and you'll bow both front tendons. Okay? Uh, it'll happen just like that. You can go from Kentucky to Calder Racetrack, and you start popping knees like mad. Why? It's a different surface. It's a different kind of... Uh, uh, surface that demands a different kind of uh, way of going and that's neuromuscular coordination to the horse if he hasn't developed a stride for the racetrack for the racing surface then you can bet your bottom dollar he's going to be in trouble that same end, devil's bag is a good example of a horse copeland uh, there are good examples of horses that given proper training uh, could have been built into animals that could have beat uh, Secretariat to world record for the mile and a half by several seconds. Uh, they weren't, and the reason they weren't is because they were sprint trained, sprint raced, and then surprised by mile races, mile and a quarter, mile and an eighth races uh, that they weren't ready for. And they succumbed to uh, uh, that kind of internal breakdown that is standard for unprepared athletes being surprised by. Uh, di races at uh, distances that they're just simply not remotely prepared to go. You want to avoid that, and you can, and you can beat the very best in this country. Uh, remember, there's no science out there. No one, the top, Charlie Whittingham, knows nothing about exercise science. He, he's got an intuitive sense of what's right and wrong about racehorses, but hey, we're talking about a billion dollar business out there, and <clears throat> no billion dollar business operates without its central technology and no one who does not know the central technology of a billion dollar industry lasts long in that industry if the central technology is being practiced by someone else so it's a huge edge to know your exercise science it's a huge huge edge to be able to uh, innovate and change the way you do things and, and keep records and know what happened when you change that way and what happened when you change this way and move through and take my mistakes and learn by them, take other people's mistakes and learn by them, watch, uh, read everything you can, uh, get with a newsletter or whatever you can do to learn about exercise science and racehorses, do. If you instead listen to what the words of Charlie Whittingham or the, the Woody Stevens or D. Wayne Lucas, you'll never learn a thing because they're not telling you anything. They're telling, they're telling you that they need $100 a day for their flower boxes. Uh, that's not training racehorses. That's not exercise science. And, the, and those people don't know exercise science. They're, they're the sitting ducks to be beat by people who do. So go get them.